this glory. Fill this place. Thank you, God. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Lord, I do thank you for your presence here today. I thank you, God, that you're here with us uh, in this moment. Uh, Lord, we don't have to uh, we don't have to hype this up. We don't have to uh, we don't have to talk all big and strong and and shouting and scream and stuff because uh, you're here in your gentle Shekinah glory, your presence that is peaceful and loving and kind. Jesus, I pray right now, Father, that as we get into your Word, God, Lord, as we um as we seek to uh, to encounter you, Lord, Jesus, would you speak into our hearts? God, would you challenge us? Would you shape us and mould us into what you want us to be? God of glory, come and rest on us. Come and rest on us. Hallelujah. Lord, we're sorry, we repent for taking your breath and using it to sing our own song. To sing about our own empire, our own calling, our own special ministry, for thinking too much of ourselves, for pushing others down to try and lift ourselves up, for vocalizing the enemy's words, with the very breath that you have breathed into us. For speaking ill of other folks. For speaking down to other folks. For patronising. Acting like fathers when we're not. Father, would you forgive us today for using your breath to do the work of our flesh or of the enemy and help us to speak truth to speak life to speak wholeness and healing to speak kingdom in Jesus name Amen, Amen, Amen feel free to grab a seat folks if you'd like to Um, I'm trying to figure all this stuff out ah there we go you know what? I sort of felt like someone popped in the back a little while ago. Did, was that just my imagination? Hmm, never mind. Anyway, I felt like someone just popped in the back and came in to say, Hey, cool. How are we all doing today? All right? Yeah. Sort of. I feel so good that I could say it out loud, you know? Um, there's not there's nothing in there, you know? I've got the joy of the Lord, but it's deep joy really deep joy that hasn't raised up to my face yet deep joy lord let it be that um that tonight uh, folks in this space might get the fits of giggles and laughter and joy in jesus name hallelujah um, i'm just gonna squidge in over a little bit because i like being in the center of the screen not at the edge of the screen there we go glory well um i'll be honest with you I've been mulling over a word for a long time, okay? Um, I've been hearing God speak. And you know, um, you know, I was away at a conference or a, like a training academy type thing uh, in the prophetic a while back. In fact, that's where I met Felicia. And, uh, and um, whilst we were there, one of the things that was spoken out was that to steal someone else's prophecy and speak it out as your own is false prophecy. Okay, it's not, it's not yours. It's not, you know, you should give credit for where credit's due, right? Um, and honour where honour is due. And so to speak out a prophecy that isn't your own is a false prophecy. To copy someone else's thing is false prophecy, okay? And, um, and I'll be honest with you, I went to that conference and I went to loads of other places and loads of other things. I've been all over the place and the whole time God has been speaking a word into my spirit. And then you go to these places and someone says something, right? And, uh, and you're like, oh, that just resonates, you know, like that really, that really sits with what God is saying to me at the moment. OK, and so um, and so at the outset of me speaking this word that I believe is God speaking over the church uh, in Lincoln, probably in the in, in the UK, maybe even in the West. Um, <laughs> hallelujah. Um, 
As I speak these words, let me just say with a caveat of um, you will have heard some of this stuff elsewhere because it feels like this is what the Spirit is saying amongst many prophets. And, and the fact that the Spirit is saying this stuff amongst many prophets would suggest that God is wanting to really speak it out to the church. And so I sort of feel like I've, um, I've, I've jumped on the bandwagon a bit late in some of this. Um, but if you would indulge me, um, I'm going to be maybe a little bit braver than some other folks um, in that um, in typical fashion, right? Because, hey, I don't really fit the criteria of Western church leader, you know? Um, I'm not sure if you can see it in the camera, but my hair isn't made today, you know? Um, because I don't care too much about appearance, you know? Like, like don't get me wrong, I, I, I shave it and cut it and that, you know? I'm not, a, I'm not a, like a rogue and I'm not some sort of animal that lives in, this, in the fields and stuff, you know? So I do cut my hair and, and you know, if, if you watch us very often, you'll notice uh, this is the second day running of Wardis T-shirt. Uh, that's for two reasons. Um, one, because, because it still smells good, okay? And, <laughs> and two, because it's long. Okay, and I knew I was going to worship today, and when I worship, I like to lift my hands up, right? And, and I'm not sure about you guys, but um, I know, like, if I was behind me, I wouldn't want to see my builder either. Um, do you hear what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> I'm not your average sort of, you know, I'm not really all that bothered about all that stuff, you know? Um, I'm not bothered about my reputation, so I'm just going to, I'm going to speak this out, and I'm going to speak it with some clarity and some depth, is that right? Um, which means, not that other folks haven't done that. Okay, not other folks have not done that, but um, some other folks may have said stuff which may be uh, misconstrued or it may even be that it's been miscommunicated and I just want to bring some light to that thing, you know, because it's true that we see through a dark glass darkly, but I believe that the Lord has placed it upon my heart to speak out a word, but to speak out a word that I had and then he's, he's opened up and made brighter. Does that make sense over the last two or three months or something? Is that okay? Cool. We up for that? Okay. So here's what the Lord said to me first. By the way, I've got loads of notes. Uh, I felt like I should write notes for this one. Um, I've been writing them on my phone for ages. Um, I, I've, wrote, I've been writing them all over the place. So I keep on jotting these things down and then God will speak to me some more and some more and some more. Um, here's what I feel like the Lord is saying. Uh, this is what the Spirit of the Lord says. He says, a church that seeks to be like the world is not going to bring redemption to it. A church that seeks to be like the world is not going to bring redemption to it. So when we, when we as a church, we have these big ideas of, of speaking into our city or into our town, into our region, and we have this notion of, certainly as prophets sometimes, we have this notion of, oh, I should... Um, I should be speaking into the secular world. But the truth is that what God is saying right now is that a, a church that seeks to be like the world cannot speak into the world to transform it. Yeah? Because that's called hypocrisy. Yeah? Why do I have the words to speak into my surroundings if I'm desperate for my surroundings to speak into me. Yeah? And so, what I feel the Lord is saying is, in, in that space is to say, is to say, he doesn't want his prophets speaking into the world. He wants his prophets right now speaking into his church. Because the rot is in the church. It's not, well, it is in the world. <laughs> but, First, we need to be transformed. And then we might be able to go on to transform the world, right? And the first place we need to start is by transforming ourselves so that we don't desire the things that the world desires. So that we don't want to look like the world. So that our structures and our lifestyles aren't like the world. Since when did the world start to tell us what love means? You know? Since when did the world start to govern our ethics? Since when did politicians who can't even, like, you know, keep their own rules start telling us how to live as good Christians, right? But what we do is we align ourselves with what we think success is in the world. 
and then we bring and we ask the world to speak into our lives rather than allowing scripture this thing to speak into our lives and allowing God to speak into our lives so the Lord says a church that seeks to be like the world cannot bring redemption to the world he goes on to say that the difference between biblical and Christian needs to be highlighted. The difference between biblical and Christian needs to be highlighted, okay? So what I mean by that is, um, I hear all the time people saying that certain ethics or politics or uh, lifestyles are biblical. But in my view, and I feel what the Lord is saying to me at the moment is this, Jesus came into the world to correct a biblical culture because biblical isn't godly biblical isn't godly a biblical idea of holiness is tell everyone else to keep the law says the pharisee whilst i go on to find loopholes to break the law does that sound like anyone that sounds like some folks that we know in the world, right? It's a religious spirit. I give you a law to keep whilst trying to find loopholes to break it myself. What's more is a good Pharisee knows all of the loopholes, right? They say the right things with their mouth, but they do the wrong things with their actions. And in, if truth be told, their intentions were wrong because their intentions were biblical. They were certainly not Christian, right? And so there is a massive disparity between biblical and Christian. Jesus came to show us that difference and to correct a biblical culture that had been born out of man trying to understand, put God in a box and then get the most out of God rather than following him with an open heart. That's what that is. Okay? So some of the things that we say are biblical. Um, the way that we treat our finances in the Western church, we say is biblical. But it's not biblical. And it's barely, definitely not Christian. We don't tithe, which is biblical. And we teach tithing, which is biblical. But in a Christian world and a Christian world view, I don't give my 10%. I give everything that I have that is extra, maybe plus a load more if I can. Yeah? The whole community comes together with plenty to help those that have none. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell all your possessions and redistribute your money amongst the poor. In the Western church, in biblical culture, we say gather, gather, gather. We use terms like triple down, trickle down economy, right? Which is, is that biblical? Is that unbiblical? Maybe if you're thinking Joseph, right? You know, gathered all the grain and then let it all trickle down into the nation and even to other nations, blessed other nations. Biblical, right? But not Jesus. You understand? It was right for then, but we shouldn't make a law out of that. We certainly shouldn't make a culture or an ethics out of that. And so biblical and Christian are two different things. Okay? We're cool with that. Do I need to explain that some more? We're good. We're good. Okay. So Jesus spoke to correct a biblical culture that had arisen out of a religious spirit. Now we use the word biblical to control and monopolize in the church. We use the word biblical to control, manipulate and monopolize in the church. This is what happens. We invite a secular leadership structure into the church so that it can teach us how to be successful according to the world. And in the world, biggest is best, richest is best, most flamboyant is best, most beautiful is best, 
right? And so what happens is you get a nice big fat church that has all of the resources and gathers them into themselves. And so the letters to the early churches in Revelation that John gave us, in one of those letters it says, the church has become really good at gathering finances and resources, but it's awful with how it uses it. And so what happens is, in the world, if Jeff Bezos wants to buy out Alibaba, then he buys them out and he monopolizes. And then guess what? He takes them out, right? Or he, or he makes it so that their quality isn't quite as good or something like that, so that his business can shoot off even better because he's monopolizing the market. In the church world, what that looks like is a church that gathers all the resources to themselves and then they try to take over any little ministries or opportunities that come up in their region, city or nation. They don't share their resources, which is kingdom. And instead, they hoard them to themselves. They don't try and reach the lost, but instead they hoard Christians to themselves. So here's an example of this, right? If I wanted to win Christians today, okay, how would I go about that? If I wanted to set up a church that all the Christians would come to, What's, what's my three first things that I need? Three things that I need. I need the best worship band. Yeah? By the way, which I probably won't share with anyone. Okay? I need the best preaching and teaching. So just to say, my talks are most likely going to be teaching and not evangelistic because Christians want teaching, not evangelism. So, so I'm going to have the best worship band and the best lighting and all that sort of stuff, right? I'm going to have the best teaching on a Sunday. Yeah? And I'm going to have, like, you know, big, beautiful buildings and all that sort of stuff, right? And it's going to look wonderful. I'm going to have all the best preachers that come into my team. I'm going to, I'm going to get all of the best youth leaders and I'm going to get all of the best stuff and take it to myself. And then if someone comes into my city who looks a little bit different, or even someone who could do what I'm doing, if people ask behind closed doors, I just need to let you know, they're a really young minister. I wouldn't go to their church. They're really young minister. I bet they've still got loads of sin in their lives. Our teaching is way better than theirs. You should sign up to one of our courses. Yeah? Oh, I heard that that guy's a sinner. (laughs) Come on, has anyone ever heard this sort of stuff before? Has anyone ever had it spoken over them before? Come on. This is what happens, honestly, this is what happens in the church. We don't trust that one because their theology is different to us, right? Yeah? Yeah? Let's ostracize them so they don't even get up off the ground because we've monopolized, yeah? And so monopoly is the way of the world and the church has invited it in. The church has invited leadership structures from the world into it. The church has invited leadership, um, leadership goals into it, yeah? Since when did Jesus say, gather as many people as you can? I don't think he said it once, did he? Um, Although thousands of people gathered around him, right? Yeah? Yeah, still went for the one coming. Yeah, he did. Since when did Jesus say, gather all the resources? Since when did Jesus say, tell folks not to partner with that person over there? Since when did Jesus say, don't share what you have? Right? Right? And that's because we've invited a worldly structure and a worldly goal and a worldly vision into the church. And the Lord is saying that it's time for us to kick it back out. To kick it back out. Um, Emma Stark um, has recently been speaking a word of prophecy over the over the church in the West, saying that um, saying that leaders 
are going to be handed their retirement slips. Have you guys heard us saying this? I was praying about it and I was like, God, what do you mean? And uh, the truth is that we don't fight against flesh and blood, right? Yeah? So I believe that when the Spirit speaks through Emma saying that stuff, what he's not saying is that particular leader who stopped me from doing something nice, right? Or that particular leader who stopped me from giving a word, or that particular leader who told me that I had to go undergo two years of ministry training before he gave me an opportunity. Come on, I was speaking to some folks. That particular leader's got to step down because he's being handed retirement papers. That's not what Emma's saying. Because we don't fight against flesh and blood. Instead, this is what the Spirit is saying through Emma. And I wanted to go a, bit, a little bit into this. The Spirit is saying that the leadership structure in the church is being retired. So the leadership structure that we've plucked out of the world so that we, could be, so that we can be successful according to the world is being retired. The leadership style, the leadership structure, the way in which we govern, the way in which we uh, try to set our goals and vision is being retired. Now here's, here's the deal. Some folks are gonna say, are gonna say, I see what God is doing, and so I'm jumping on board with the new thing. I'm jumping on board with a kingdom mentality and a kingdom structure and a kingdom growth. You know, I'm jumping on board with what God is doing. But other folks are gonna say, I really flourished in the old structure. And I just don't think I've got it in me to change. And so, because I don't think I've got it in me to fall in line with what God is doing right now, I think it's best that I retire. And so when Emma says that leaders are going to be handed their retirement slips, that's not God saying, here's your retirement slip, I'm forcing you to retire. That is some leaders going, I just don't fancy learning all this all over again. I just don't fancy going down that road. I just don't fancy doing it that way because I was so successful the way that we did it. And so I'm choosing to retire. And so they will ask the Lord for their retirement slip. They will ask God and they will say, God, I don't think I can do this anymore. I don't understand the culture that we're living in. I don't understand the church and what's going on in it. I don't understand these young people saying these really random things, right? And so I feel like it's time for me to step down. And I feel, I believe that's what God is doing and saying. So what does the church need to do? Well, the church, the big C church, we need to change. We need to change. We need to repent for inviting world leaders, politicians, leaders of massive companies to come in and tell us how to run a church. We need to repent of getting marketing directors. We need to repent of monopolizing the best we can, of speaking ill of other folks, other ministers. We need to repent of not sharing. We need to repent A church that seeks to be like the world is not going to bring redemption to it. How about as individuals? I want to ask tonight, have you invited the world's ethics into your life? Yeah. Have you invited the world's ethics into your life? If that's the case, then I think we need to pray and repent. And maybe folks at home or in the room, wherever you are, maybe you just want to put your hand on your heart and go, you know what? I have invited the world's ethics in. And I've let the world decide what my morality looks like. And I know some people have some really strong opinions. I know loads of folks are going to go on about like things like LGBT and, and like, you know, um, like abortion and stuff. But there's much bigger issues than that. 
much bigger issues than that in the church today. The way that we treat each other is not okay. The way that we love each other isn't okay. The way that we support each other isn't okay. We've become a company, not a family. We need to repent of that. So let's pray together and repent and just say, Father, you know what? I'm sorry for using your breath to sing my own song. I'm sorry for using your gifts to build my own empire. I'm sorry for inviting the world's ethics into my life. And allowing the world to tell me what's right or wrong. And sometimes even disagreeing with what your word says. Have you invited the world's lifestyle into your life? Have you invited the world's lifestyle into your life? Why does everyone want to be rich and famous, man? I was watching the whole documentary thing on Hillsong, bless them, bless their cotton socks. You know, great worship, great what they've blessed the church so much. And I was watching it and I oh no, everyone was going on about, ah, oh, celebrity pastor, this celebrity pastor, that. Right? Who made them a celebrity? Me, right? I bought their CDs, I went on their website, I watched all their sermons, I lifted them up in my own eyes. Why? Because if they can be a celebrity, then so can I. Come on, let's get real, right? If they can be a celebrity, then so can I. So I lift them up. I promote them. I tell everyone how wonderful they are. I buy their music. I buy their t-shirts. I treat them like superstars. And then later on, when they fall, guess what happens? I start having a go. Oh, we shouldn't have celebrity culture in the church anyway. Who made them a celebrity? I did. Why? Because I want a celebrity lifestyle. I want to have a lovely car and a lovely house. Now, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm just about to buy a lovely house and I've got a lovely car. I've got a lovely wife and great kids. So I'm, I'm doing great, you know. I am absolutely smashing life. I'm going to buy a quad bike as well, just saying. And a house. I'm going to buy a house. But here's the thing, right? All that flashy glitz and glamour and all that sort of stuff. That lifestyle that we all seek. All the kids out there want to be a footballer, right? That's the world, right? Why is that in the church? I want to be like Hillsong. I want to be the leader of evangelism in Elim, or I want to be the leader of evangelism in the Evangelical Alliance, or, you know, like I say evangelism because I'm the evangelist, right? So I'm picking on myself, you know? But my desire is come from the world, not from God. And so I need to repent of allowing the world to speak into my lifestyle, right? and trying to take something out of the world and gather it to myself. And so if that's you, then maybe, again, we can put a hand on our heart. You know, I can always tell when I'm doing a good one because the viewers drop on Facebook. Um, <laughs> glory. Yeah, God, I'm, I'm really aware that I have promoted a celebrity culture within the church. I've highlighted people that I think are wonderful. I don't even know what their lifestyle's like. I emailed them once and they never even got back to me. I repent of that. They don't care about me and they, I'll let them speak into my life more than I let my pastor. Who loves me, takes care of me every week, looks after me. I begged the big prophet on a telly for a word. When my pastor speaks a bit of wisdom into my life, I tell him he doesn't know what he's on about. But I repent for allowing the world and its lifestyle and its desires into my life. In Jesus' name. There is always a risk that I'll just keep on preaching and speaking all night. 
we're okay with that though, aren't we? I heard everyone say yes in their hearts. Um, <laughs> we need to repent because we have invited the world's idea of commitment and loyalty into our lives. These are just words that God was speaking to me for individuals. I've spoken into the church now, I've done that bit. I've spoken into the Western church. About five people might listen to that. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Now I'm speaking into individuals' lives, you know? Have you invited the world's idea of commitment and loyalty into your life? Which means that I'm loyal as long as you've got something for me, right? I'm loyal as long as you've got something for me. We're only friends as long as I can gain something. As soon as you stop preaching the words that I want you to preach, I'm off. As soon as you stop bringing me food round on your food runs, I'm off. We get that all the time. <laughs> Good job, none of them listen to it. Um, as soon as, as soon as, as soon as you know, you stop coming around my house. You know, is anyone got a friend like this? You know, like. You go around their house, right? And they invite you around like every other week, right? Because you're best mates now and they want to live in your pocket. And then as soon as you're like, you know what, actually, um, your house is quite far away, actually. Could you come around mine this week? They're like, don't want to be mates with you anymore. You know them ones? Yeah, that's the world's ethics, isn't it? No, not ethics, sorry. That's the world's commitment. That's the world's loyalty, you know? Come on. As a pastor, can I just say this, right? The thing that I need or desire more than anything else is a bit of loyalty. Just a bit of loyalty. Someone who's going to say, if you upset me, I'm not going to disappear. What I need in my life and around my life are folks like that. You know, encouragers at good times, speakers of truth at rough times. But whatever happens, they're going to stick around, right? That's what I need in my life. Do you need that? Come on, we all need a bit of that, don't we? Yeah. We can do two prayers now. God, give me some people like that. Lord, help me to be a person like that. I'm sorry. Come on. You don't have to join in with all these prayers, by the way. I just These are all just things that I've got going on at the moment in the spirit. Lord, I'm sorry for allowing the world to teach me and tell me how commitment and loyalty works. God, I'm sorry for allowing the world and its stupid beliefs and structures into my life would you help me to be committed and loyal as a friend as a follower as a as a Christian there weren't many people at that cross God I want to be like one of them now Amen. Amen. One more. Two more. Ten more. Um, have you invited the world's idea of love into your life? Love for me, the word agape in scripture, is unagendered love. Love without strings. Love that doesn't need to get in order to, in order to, you know, keep on going. What's the scriptures say? It's patient, it's kind. It's long-suffering, loyal. Love is loyal. And yet we have this idea in our heads of what love looks like. And so... We go chasing after a member of the opposite sex like it's a do or die. Because we lust. Or because we've been told by Disney that every princess needs a prince. My Bible says that singleness is a gift of God. Good job I didn't know that before I got married. Not that I don't love Laura because I really, really do. But I would have missed out big time if... I had learned that before I got married, right? Because I was so legalistic when I got saved. I would have just left everyone. I'd probably be somewhere in the 
African bush at the moment, like on mission somewhere, totally missed my calling. Just all by myself, thinking I was some sort of special apostle or something, you know. And um, I would have missed my calling if, it, if I'd have learned that before I got married. Because I was so legalistic. But for those of you who aren't married, and uh, this isn't for everyone, you know, if you're thinking about getting married, then so be it. But some of you are actually called to be single. You're called to be single, to not have anything tying you down. Do you know the amount of, um, I know I'm preaching now, sorry everyone, I'll stop in a second. Um, the amount of people, right, that I've encountered in my, I've been a Christian for nine, no, I've been a leader for nine years. I've been a Christian for 14 years, something like that. Anyway, 2008, is that right? Yeah, 14 years I've been a Christian, right? In that time, I've encountered ministry after ministry after ministry after ministry that has been broken up and destroyed by marriage. Not, not, I'm not lying to you, honestly. Amazing evangelist, going to one of the biggest churches in the country, yeah? Been given an opportunity to minister. He's even got credentials. His wife doesn't feel like that's her calling. So they move back to a small little town somewhere. And she just goes and gets a job working in the factory. And he has this thing in his heart that he can't see through to fruition because he's got this tie. Should he divorce her? No, it's too late now, right? We believe that, right? But boy, should he have married her? Probably not. Because they were on totally different journeys. He's now depressed. He's now depressed. His whole family is suffering because of it. One of his kids tried taking an overdose. Like, this is real life. Like This is real. Like, this is an actual personal story. I'm glad I didn't tell you what their name was. This is someone that I know. And I see it over and over and over again because people get married when they're called to be single. Have you invited the world's idea of love into your life? Or Disney's idea of love into your life? Maybe it's time to repent of that and make sure you've got your motives right. Put our hands on our hearts again, shall we? God, I need this bit changing. I need this bit changing. I need this bit changing. God, I'm sorry. I watched too many Disney films when I was a kid and now I just want to find a prince. Or princess. Got this idea that the perfect family is 2.4 children husband and wife together forever I don't know who told me it it wasn't my bible it was the news the news lied God I'm sorry for allowing the world to input into my idea of love I repent of that false love In Jesus' name. Amen. I have one more thing just there. Is that right? Are we up for it? I have to read it. I've written really rough. Have you allowed the world to tell you what your calling or purpose is? Have you allowed the world to tell you what your calling or purpose is? We live in a utilitarian society. You guys know what that means? It means you are what you do. You are what you do. So, hi, my name's Darren, and I'm an evangelist, apostle, pastor, teacher, something or other, I don't know, something. I preach, right? Which makes me a preacher. Hi, my name's Darren, I'm a preacher. You know what? No, I'm not a preacher. Hi, my name's Darren, I'm a son of the Most High God. Right? Yeah? Hey, you're not a cleaner. That's not who, that's not who you are. You know? Hey, you know, <laughs> can, I, can I be really naughty? Is that all right? You guys are all right being be naughty? Yeah? Hey, you're not a victim of sexual abuse. You're a son or daughter of God. All right? Yeah? Hey, you're not gay. 
you're a son or daughter of God. Yeah? Yeah? Now, you can be gay and be a son or daughter of God, but don't let gay be your identity. Let son or daughter of God be your identity. Right? Yeah? We cool with that, yeah? If that upsets you, then I'm not really sorry, but it's all right. Um, <laughs> it's all right, isn't it? Hey, you're not a teacher. You're a son or daughter of the Most High God. You know? Am I speaking tr- I'm, I know, I don't even know. I'm not asking you. I know I'm speaking truth. It's good stuff. <laughs> Come on. Should we stand? We're going to worship again. And um, I'm really aware that I've accidentally probably spoken for like 50 minutes. Sorry, everyone. Um, we're going to worship in a second. And then... And then what's going to happen is if any of the prophets in here fancy giving a word tonight, then that's cool. I don't even know who's online. I think Eleanor's online. Hello, Eleanor. If you're online and you want to say hey, then please do. Uh, Premla, hello, Premla. All the way over in Malaysia. God bless you for joining us. Um, we've got Lisa watching. I think Wales. Anne Marie is in Wales. Dee is in Lincoln. Dee, why aren't you here? <laughs> Mum is in Northampton. Debs is in Lincoln. Paul Lee. Hello, Paul Lee. Hello, mate. You're in the room. What are you doing on there as well? <laughs> if anyone feels like they've got a personal prophetic word for in the room, then go and grab your person and pray for them and then prophesy over them. Ask them first if that's all right. That's just kind, isn't it? Good manners. But this is the final opportunity to come and speak to someone. Anyone would like to do that? Three, two, one. You missed a chance. In that case, let's pray. God, you are absolutely amazing. And you want something amazing for your church. You want your church to come back to your way of doing church. You want your church to give up trying to be like the world and all things that are successful in it. You want your church to flourish and to use all of the gifts that it has at its disposal and then to share them out. Father, you want your church to be holy. Holy. And Lord, you want the same thing for us. So God, help us as individuals not to let the... What's the scripture say? Who rules the world? Who rules the world and everything in it? Who rules secular? Satan, right? Why are we letting him speak into our lives and into our church? Lord, I'm so sorry for allowing that beast to dictate how I live. Lord, I'm sorry for allowing that beast to tell me how to run this church. I'm sorry for when I've stifled what you're doing. Because I know that if I'm in control, And I can limit the loss. I can limit the blow. Today, Father, I as a church leader say, in case I haven't said it already, I give you back control. I give you back authority over your church. And whatever you decide to do with it, is up to you because if you're not in it there's no point in us coming if you're not in it there's no point in following if you're not in it I'm just wasting my time I don't want to get to heaven and you go well done Darren for building your own empire all these other folks would help him to build my kingdom I probably won't even see a single face and recognise it. (laughs) So 
so wrapped up in my own empire, right? To notice what you were doing, God. So Lord, help us. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name. Amen.